there's been a time for gathering the longhouse and sharing information around the fire. This is our contribution to that tradition. I'm out on the slopes of Bald Mountain, which doesn't tell you a whole lot. It's a pretty commonplace name. What I'm going to talk about is uh, gear selection for backpacking. So there's two significant factors that go into selecting gear. One is the environment that you're going to be in, and the second is your personal capabilities. Environment affects things like um, how rugged the gear is that you need, how much insulation and shelter you need, how much water you need to carry, what you need to carry to procure water, um, what kinds of temperature extremes you have to deal with, um, and a whole host of things like that. As far as your personal capability, part of it is fitness, part of it is size, you should only carry 25 to 30 percent of your body weight if you're going to plan on going very far like that. And uh, then a big part of it is how well you know the environment that you're going into. The better you know the environment, the more you can tune your gear to what you're going to actually need. If you're going to do an environment you don't have much experience in, you don't have any choice but to carry a little bit extra because you just don't have the experience base. A to understand what you're faced with and B to make sure you stay out of trouble and don't end up needing spear gear to get yourself out of trouble. So when I think of gear uh, I divide it into three main categories as far as uh, gear on the trail. First of all is insulation. Yeah, maybe we'll let that do what it's going to do. First of all is insulation. Uh, literally what protects you from radiant heat or even conductive heat loss. Um, second is shelter, which insulation technically is shelter, but uh, I think more in terms of protecting you from the wind, the rain, the sun, uh, shelter. Uh, and then tools, which I further break down into tools that you expect to use, that you use regularly, and then tools that are contingency use. They're just in case items. And uh, when you start out backpacking, there's going to be two categories where, where you carry too much weight. First of all is contingency tools. And it, it has to do with, well, I don't know what I need, so I'm going to take a whole lot of things. And then the second part is food. It's kind of hard to cut down on food weight. Uh, you're, what you're looking for is a pound and a half to two pounds per day of food weight. Um, so those are the two categories where you want to really look carefully, but as I said before, if, you don't, if you're not familiar with an environment and you haven't spent time on the trail, you don't know what you're going to need personally. Because everybody is different. Um, my requirements on the trail are different than somebody else's requirements on the trail. So I'm going to just go through what's in my pack to talk about how I... Uh, what I carry and and how I break it down. I mean as you can see I spend time in mountain environments a lot of time in mountain environments also desert environments living in western Colorado split my time between both I actually end up carrying about the same thing in both cases in the desert Typically, I don't have to carry as much much insulation. I might carry a little bit more water but you get up into these mountains mid to late summer and most of the, the water pack in, the, in forms of snow melt is further down valley. And so if you want to spend time up in the high country, you might well be carrying as much water up here as you would down in the desert. All right, so speaking of water, which is crucial, on my belt, I carry two 0.75 liter bottles. And then in my wand pockets here, I carry another two full quarts. Now you can tailor that, I mean that's a fair amount of water weight. Water weighs two pounds a quart. That's a fair amount of water weight to be trucking around in the mountains with. Um, and if you're willing and have the discipline to stop more often and you're in an area where there's enough water, you can get by with carrying less than, well this is three and a half quarts, nearly a gallon that I'm carrying typically. Um, but 
if you're not going to stop as often as you should, you're going higher where water sources are uncertain, this is pretty much always what I carry, sometimes a little bit more. So this uh, tool's expected use, the ability to carry water and definitely keep up with having enough water. A person's water requirement um, is a gallon to a gallon and a half a day out on the trail. And the harder you're working, the higher that might be. Also, if you're built like me, a uh, relatively uh, low surface area to volume ratio, and it's hard to dispel heat, you're gonna go through more water. That's just the way it works. Toilet paper, tools, expected use. And uh, the other thing is um, hand sanitizer, which is a boon to backpackers. So that's my ready to go. I have a Polar Tech fleece beanie. Uh, this is, I'd, I'd say expected use. I don't always use it, but I use it often enough. Uh, you crawl into the sleeping bag at night, it doesn't matter how warm it is, you throw a beanie on your head because the sleeping bag is open at the top. I mean, yeah, you can scrunch it down and whatnot, but the beanie uh, makes a makes a big difference. You come to a stop at a trail, the wind's blowing, throw this thing on, you know, take your sweaty hat off, throw this thing on. That's a good plan. So tools expected use. And that is it for that pocket. And that's all we're still talking about tools expected use. First aid kit, uh, that's contingency only. This is not something I ever really have to break into. Uh, sometimes if I'm on the trail with somebody else, um, I'm not gonna go into detail on what's on the first aid kit. Perhaps that's, uh, that's another lesson, but uh, I do carry this. And this is contingency only, like I said. Uh, a, a word on that. I think this weighs three quarters of a pound, relatively heavy for a trail first aid kit, but I am often off trail, um, almost always solo. And so the margin of safety that I wanna carry with me in terms of self-aid is a little bit bigger than if I were traveling with a group. Okay, so these next two items fall in the category of shelter. Uh, I have a knee length rain jacket here, waterproof breathable jacket, um, that it, it serves two purposes. Uh, first of all, protecting me from wind, rain, all that sort of thing. Second of all, um, I zip it up, pull it over the foot of my sleeping bag, and it adds extra warmth and waterproofness to my sleep system. Also, when it comes to shelter, this is a wind shirt. This happens to be one of our wind cheaters. Um, but basically, and if you're in the high country, it's really um, convective heat loss, the wind that robs you of heat much more quickly than any number of other things. Uh, and so this is very breathable, sheds moisture a little bit, but the big thing is it will cut the wind for you. So again, this is shelter. Now I do use it as a mid layer underneath a rain jacket from time to time. I wear it into the sleeping bag. So it kind of crosses the line between shelter and insulation. Now, because I knew I was going into a dry camp tonight, I actually threw in a spare canteen. I probably won't actually end up using all the water that I have here, but uh, extra margin of error, two pounds. If I didn't need it, call it training weight. All right, so 50 foot of, I don't remember if this is four mil or five mil, uh, good for hanging a bear bag, perhaps if I had to lower a pack down a cliff. Um, this is contingency, honestly. I don't use it that often. Um, rarely do I hang a bear bag the way I travel, the kind of country I travel. The bears are wild here. They're not trash bears like you might find in other areas, and they really don't want to have anything to do with me, typically. Um, so this is something that I don't know the weight on it. Um, you know, I talk about weight. For me, if something uh, represents a three ounce difference, I'm gonna start looking real hard at it. Three to four ounces, that's a quarter pound. You make enough of those three ounce decisions and, and it's a big difference. So at any rate, uh, I don't know the weight on this. If it's two ounces, I don't care. I suspect it's more like three or four. Um, maybe it's something that I stopped carrying. I don't know, we'll see.
So insulation. Uh, when you think about your insulation, you need to think about it in totality. There's the insulation that you're carrying on the trail, uh, or that you plan to wear outside of sleeping, and then there's your sleeping insulation. If you're not wearing, if you're not using just about all of your insulation when it comes time to sleep, you're actually wasting weight. So, you know, whether you're talking about clothing you can wear inside of a sleeping bag, or um, in the case of my system, a, an over bag that doubles as clothing, uh, you really should have a strategy for utilizing most, if not all, of your insulation um, when you're sleeping. So this is one of our mountain serapes. It's a great coat. Um, I throw it on over, um, over whatever else I'm wearing if I need warmth around camp, but it's also an over bag for my sleeping bag. So because I'm carrying this, I don't carry nearly as warm of a sleeping bag. So tonight it could well get down into the 30s here where I am. I've got a 40 degree bag with me and the mountain serape is good for about 20 to 30 degrees of gain. So I've got a comfortable margin of safety, storm blows in, you know, it dumps four or five inches of snow. I'm still sitting pretty. Uh, as we get closer to the fall, that'll be a 20 degree sleeping bag I carry in addition to this. Um, in my experience, once it gets cold, cold is just simply cold and, and uh, a lot of insulation has its place. Uh, that's all I carry. You see no puffy jackets here uh, year round, even when it's going to be getting down into the single digits, mountain serape plus a suitable sleeping bag is my insulation. Uh, in the straight up winter, I will also add puffy pants. Uh, there's one other little piece of insulation that I carry that I'll get to in a minute. Food bag. Uh, what exactly to carry for food is the subject of, uh, of, some, of another lesson, but at any rate, this is my food bag. And that, of course, is tools expected to use. On this trip, I've got my daughter with me, so I'm carrying a much bigger shelter than I normally would. Um, this is a six-man um, floorless teepee, um, and it has its place. It doesn't weigh horribly much. I think it's around seven pounds all up. Um, and so when it comes to shelters, uh, I prefer shoreless, floorless shelters. I prefer being able to walk into them. I prefer... Um, the the weight of them they're relatively lightweight the simplicity of them um, on the downside most of the floorless shelters available now and yeah, just about all of them i think hilleberg might be an exception are not freestanding and you know they're teepee style or, or a, a mega mid or, or or some variation thereof and the downside is they are relying on stake integrity for their structural integrity so you can't pitch one just anywhere. And if you lose a stake due to changing ground conditions, changing snow conditions, and you get a loose side and you're in the wind, that wind's gonna start working on the loose side and uh, you can lose one. I'm not saying they don't work. I've used them a whole lot, but there's downsides. Um, for a lot of folks, if, you know, if you're not used to, uh, you don't wanna deal with being out on the ground, bugs and such, you know, REI brand tents are fantastic tents. Uh, the weight to usability ratio is really good on them. They're a good value price. Um, that's a good way to go. Um, by far my favorite uh, shelters are freestanding floorless. Go Light used to make some, they're out of business. That's what I use most of the time is my Go Light. Um, I, some of the Hilleberg shelters are designed to be pitched that way. Now, oh, here's a word on the tents. A lot of tents, um, double wall tents, traditional tents, have a fly only option, but when you look closely, it's the fly with four to five inches above the ground. So there's a four to five inch gap all the way around. Just about worthless. Um, particularly up in the high country, you get wind coming through, you know, maybe get out down in the center of it, but you're gonna have to try to create walls around that floor So don't get suckered in thinking. Oh, that's that's a floorless single wall shelter It's not it doesn't work the same way the Hillebergs actually do go all the way to the ground I haven't personally used one and another reputation is outstanding um, So so Hilleberg is maybe an option. They're not inexpensive um, But so that's a little bit on shelters uh, And in case you know, this, this might come up as well, uh, tarp slash bivy sack, or the tarp bivy sack combo. Um, I've probably at this point, I've spent more time under a, um, 
freestanding floorless than anything else, but there was definitely a time where I had done way more tarp camping than anything. And you know, it's fun, there's an art to it, but the bottom line is that you're gonna spend more time, more effort, more energy getting your tarp pitched than if you just put up a floorless shelter. And then in the middle of the night, the wind comes around and now all of a sudden the storm's blowing in the one open end you left to get in. Um, it works, it's light. There's a good feeling of being able to see out, but uh, I've moved on and I'm, I'm not a huge fan of them. They make great emergency shelters, but for a first choice um, backpacking shelter, not, not my favorite. So this is a um, ultralight waterproof dry bag that I line my entire pack with. It's actually volume wise, like twice the size of my pack. Gives me a place to store stuff around camp if I need to. Um, oh, I've actually used it as an emergency bivy at one, well, not bivy, but I already had the coat around my um, sleeping bag. And I also added this for extra warmth. So inside of this bag, uh, first of all, what I call my tent bag, lightweight mesh sack, uh, spare toilet paper, spare socks, spare winter weight long underwear top. Those are crucial. Whenever you're in the back country, make sure that you have dry socks and dry long underwear top, always. If you have to stop and dry a pair, do it. But you don't want to be in the situation where all of your base layers are dry. So always maintain those in reserve. <clears throat> uh, pillow, I think this one is made by Xpad. A lot of people will use a coat as a pillow which to me says you're not using the insulation you should be. Uh, it should be part of your sleep system. Um, brush, the beard gets itchy after a couple days on the trail. Ibuprofen for um, helping you sleep, easing aging joints. Uh, spare uh, spork, uh, my, my spoon typically rides in my kit bag, but if I accidentally left it at home because it was in the washing machine or something, um, it's good to have a backup. And uh, da, 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 toothbrush, toothpaste, uh, sleeping pad. So this is two things. This is um, comfort. If you don't have a good sleeping system that lets you recharge overnight, all you're doing is trading off of whatever you hit the trail with. If you can't recharge every night, your time out here is gonna be pretty finite. So it's comfort. Uh, but also it protects you from the ground, conductive, uh, from conductive heat loss. And you look at the R value of a sleeping pad to figure out how much insulation it's gonna provide you from the ground. Uh, this is a Thermarest Neo Air Trekker. Since uh, I got this, I haven't even looked at any other pads. This really, between this and the pillow, I sleep about as well as I do at home. Um, one other part of my sleep system, I'm actually sitting on a Crazy Creek uh, chair and um, it serves two purposes. One, one of the main things I do out here is um, look at the country, look at animals, film animals, and um, <clears throat> I have tried going without the chair. It just gives me that extra uh, measure of comfort that I'm not willing to go without. The other thing is, it is backup insulation that I can sleep on. This winter I had uh, a um, sin mat, who makes that? Xped, I believe as well. Xped sin mat, um, deflate on me in the middle of the night and it was below zero. So I spent most of the night curled up on my chair because it is closed cell foam and it kind of gave me that edge, uh, that backup edge for conductive heat loss. Um, booties, these are Prima Loft booties uh, by Wild Things. These were a gift from a friend and they are fantastic. They have Cordura bottoms and they actually have felt on the inside as far as the bottoms are concerned. I use these, uh, I wear these year round. I wear them over my socks into the sleeping bag. They let me get out in the middle of the night and have some protection for my feet other than for cactus. That happened, I think that was this winter down lower. Uh, not awesome. Um, but at any rate, uh, the extra warmth on my feet is really nice regardless of what time of year it is. And um, they let me they let me get out in the middle of the night without having to put shoes on or anything. Uh, and then my sleeping bag, like I mentioned before, 40 degree bag. Uh, I basically always carry uh, North Face Synthetics. The price is right. Um, 
in, unless you're getting like 850 fill power or better down, synthetic's actually more warmth per weight. Um, not quite as compressible, but compressible enough. And like I said, the price is very right. Plus, North Face bags have more girth than just about any other bag on the on the market, which brings up an important point. Um, a lot of people will say you cannot sleep in your sleeping bag with your clothes on because it'll make you colder. That's not really true, um, but there's there's exceptions. So if you get into your sleeping bag with wet socks on, in my experience, you'll have a hard time ever warming those feet up overnight. Um, in my case, a wet base layer, I've got a little bit more of a margin, like I'm more likely to be able to warm it up overnight, but it could keep me chilled well into the night. So you need to start out with dry base layers when you get in your sleeping bag. Uh, and then the other thing is, if your bag is too constrictive and you wear clothing inside of your bag, you're actually compressing the sleeping bag insulation and your clothing insulation. So you're kind of robbing the effect of both. So uh, if you're planning on wearing your clothes inside your sleeping bag, which I recommend, otherwise you're just wasting weight, um, it needs to be a sleeping bag big enough to allow all of that insulation to properly loft. Okay, so that's it for uh, for uh, the expected use stuff that's uh, inside my main pack. Now we'll look at what else I'm carrying here. Uh, water filter, this is a uh, Sweetwater Guardian. Uh, been using a lot of years, very happy with it. Uh, it is a filter, not a purifier, so it doesn't help with viruses. Um, I know that the, uh, the Sawyers are getting more popular. Uh, they work either on gravity or squeeze. The problem that I found, you can't always find a big enough spot to fill a, a bladder for gravity or squeeze. Um, up in the high country here, you may be sucking water from a stream that's running underneath a talus field. Um, down in the desert, you may, may be dipping a hose down into a Tanaha that you're gonna have a hard time getting to. So I still prefer a pump, um, a pump-based filter myself. Um, but, you know, if you're in a place where you can always get nice open water to dip that up, great, drive on with that. Um, sunglasses, uh, I should wear them more than I do in the high country. Uh, if there's any kind of reflection, like off of a talus field, you'll get snow blindness very quickly, but it is crucial to carry these. The reason I don't like to, um, they uh, interfere with my ability to, to see animals. <clears throat> Uh, my cook system, I use an alcohol stove and a Halulite Minimalist. There's another video about that. Um, other, other folks have other preferences, but this is my main way that I'm going to be um, cooking when I'm in the backcountry. Uh, I'm still carrying a, a, a fixed blade knife. This honestly is contingency. Uh, out in the field, on the trail, backpacking, I don't really use a knife at all. Oh, I've also got a pocket knife that I'll open food package with, packages with occasionally. But this is eight ounces all up, and it's a nice solid piece of quarter inch D2 steel. Uh, if I ended up processing an animal, if I needed to construct a more serious shelter, uh, collect some insulation in the form of pine boughs, uh, this is something that would help out with that. So um, really what's the value of carrying this? I don't end up using it a lot, but I, I guess I'm too much the woodsman to, to not have a real blade with me. Uh, Delorme Enreach, satellite communicator, uh, lets me find out if there's anything going on at home, I need to go home early, uh, or, you know, I let them know I'm okay, and it also has a function that allows me to, to let folks know if I'm in trouble. Uh, basically, you know, if you're a family man, you have responsibilities, and you're not carrying one of these, you're really being negligent. Um, you know, if you got nobody to paint up on you, fine, whatever. But if you're if you're solo traveling like I do, and you don't have this extra margin of error, uh, and you got a family, you really need to rethink your life, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so at any rate, that's a good piece of kit that I use nightly. Uh, gators, the other part of my shelter from water, I wear those underneath my pants uh, in the rain, over my pants in the snow. Underneath lets the water shingle on the outside instead of running down the inside because I'm not wearing rain pants. I've just got these and the knee length rain parka. Uh, a word on pants, my trail pants. Um, the best uh, trail pants ever were the REI Acmes. They were lightweight soft shell. 
Um, those haven't been made in, I don't know, four or five years. Uh, once those wore out, I kind of went through a series of other pants and I've ended up with these Duluth, I think they're called Comfort Flex, dry on the fly. And I've just been using them this summer, but I'm real happy with the construction of them. Um, they're the right weight, they're the right durability. Um, so I've been real happy with those. Um, and then uh, as far as shirts concerned, I'm wearing my standard three seasons out of the year, cotton shirt. Okay, fly, get off of there. Um, cotton shirt, this is like a 60 cotton, 40 uh, nylon, real thin, tightly woven. Um, and this is far more comfortable than long underwear if you're dealing with heat. So for me, above about 60 degrees, this is what I'm gonna be wearing. However, I do have uh, an honest to goodness long underwear shirt, a synthetic to put on, you know, if the weather gets into that margin where I need to be moving, wearing something like this. Um, and it's also what I'll put on at night. Um, I let this thing dry out and I'll put this on in my sleeping bag. Um, same thing with the socks, a uh, spare pair of socks. I run a three sock system, two pair are always rotating. Uh, so I'll put these dry ones on when I get into the sleeping bag at night and then I'll probably wear them in the morning and let the ones that are currently on my feet uh, go all day drying out. If it's a hotter day and I'm moving more often, I might actually switch off in the middle of the day. And then my third pair is the pair you already saw in my tent bag that's always in reserve. And sometimes on longer trips, I'll end up rotating through those. But the rule is always have a dry pair, you know, in a, in a good location, then you can be retoting. Uh, rotating through the other two. Um, six gallon, or I'm sorry, six quart uh, drum, MSR drum light bladder. I've had these fail. I've actually had every brand of bladder fail, so I don't really trust bladders for like regular use, but I carry this for, you know, hey, I'm gonna go up there and I'm gonna overnight or spend two nights up there. There's no water, I can carry it in this. Uh, same thing for the desert. It's not horribly heavy for the amount of extra margin of safety it provides in terms of my ability to stock up on water and carry it if I need to. Okay, and then this is, this is really my biggest thing. This is a pound and a half of uh, stuff. There's another video on this, um, but uh, this is stuff I never use. This is my tools contingency, and I've got it whittled, whittled down to that that I'm haven't so far been willing to dump any of that um, but like I said there's a fair amount of weight sitting there I never use. So as far as what's uh, what I carry in my kit bag backpacking uh, camera goes here big old point and shoot these are Nomex gloves with leather palms I can work with fire just fine but they also have good insulative capabilities uh, this rarely gets used this is a uh, grid fleece beanie made by Melanzana in Leadville, Colorado. Um, what this is for, this is about the heaviest beanie that I want to wear when I am moving. Uh, and usually I'll just wear the ball cap year round with a hood over it if I need more warmth, but sometimes I'll end up doing this. <clears throat> Headlamp. I do also have a, a AAA light in my pocket, stream light something pro um, compass uh, heed for electrolyte replacement this because I sh don't stop any use often as I should this is some hammer gel um, I do carry a little bit of <laughs> I think of this as a medical bag but uh, Advil again if I'm cramping on the trail and I'm too stubborn to stop um, some coffee or a uh, Starbucks via packet and uh, some Prilosec. I also carry a note card or two and a mechanical pencil. Mechanical pencil. Mechanical pencil is the only thing I've found that doesn't uh, doesn't actually break on the trail. Or the, to be more precise, the lead breaks, but it's easily replaceable. And I get a little uh, signaling kit here, uh, whistle, and um, uh, a mirror, as well as a backup photon light. I do carry some uh, spare water purification tabs in here. Fire starting kit. Uh, if I'm running a wood stove, I'll use that a lot. Otherwise, backpacking, typically, I don't start a fire at all. Waste of time, waste of energy. I'd rather be looking at the critters. Then in the front here, 100% uh, deep. If you 
speed whips aren't getting numb. It's not doing you any good. Um, good uh, earplugs if I want to shoot. I also carry these. Uh, this type of earplug, I think it's made by Surefire, maybe called an EP3. Uh, and these are kind of a passive. You can hear okay wearing them, but uh, loud noises, the baffle will close off on the inside and attenuate it. You don't want to go shoot all day with it, but uh, like for hunting, it's good for that occasional shot, but you still need your hearing. Uh, and then my spoon. And finally, a map of the area that I'm traveling. Uh, so, so that's what's in the kit bag. I do also carry uh, trekking poles, uh, three section trekking poles, so they break down in my uh, and go in my pack nicely. Uh, irrefutably, they cut down on the amount of energy you spend uphill, downhill, whatever. Uh, I typically don't use them on the uphill unless I get to the middle of a day and I'm completely like spent, but I still have somewhere I want to go. I'll pull them out. That's my second wind. That'll get me further down the trail. And then I almost always um, use them descending, just old knees. That's the way of it. Um, so, so that's uh, another couple of pieces of gear. Okay, so that's, uh, that's, that's the start of your long journey to preparing for the trail as far as gear is concerned. Just remember that everything's um, based on the environment, it's based on your capabilities and, and your own preferences, and um, it's gonna take you some time to get everything dialed in. When you get back from every trip, go through your pack, make a pile of things you used, make a pile of things you didn't use. Go through the didn't use pile, and um, for every item, didn't use but I really need to carry it for safety or didn't use and you know what I just don't need to be carrying that uh, do that a few trips you'll get pretty dialed in for for the environment that you're traveling in um, let's see if there's anything else yeah that pretty well covers it um, you know make your own choices there's no magic bullet everything's a trade-off uh, but mostly get out there use your stuff figure out what works for you figure out your system and uh, Pay attention and refine it as you go.